Greetings in that name that is above every name, for the Bible declares at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue must confess that he is Lord. How blessed we are, how wonderful it is to be here on this wonderful Wednesday evening to share in God's word and to study and to see what God has to say through his word. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Bow with me for a moment of prayer. God, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for another privilege that we are able to join in fellowship and the study of thy word. We ask that you would allow us to draw our minds in now and concentrate on your word. We ask your blessings upon all of those who have tuned in and who are listening. We pray for the strength and give us the strength to deal with the task that's now in front of us. For we know that you are able to do all things which are in harmony with your purpose. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, and amen. All right, God bless, God bless. We are so delighted. Welcome second Mount Zion, Philadelphia and vicinity across the country and around the world. Amen. Who do we have with us today, tonight? We welcome Sister Dorothy Stokes. Amen. Welcome Deacon Daniel J. Johnson. Welcome. Uh, Sister Catherine Spain, welcome. Deacon Charles Parker, our Georgia connection all the way from Sylvania, Georgia, welcome. Sister Josephine Wright, we, are the, we welcome Deacon Norman Haskins and Minister Wilhelmina Haskins, welcome. Sister Karen White, welcome. Sister Susie Reed, another Georgia connection all the way from Sylvania, Georgia. How blessed we are to have folk watching from all over the country and around the world. Welcome, Brother June Cole. Welcome, Sister Rosa Bedford, and welcome back. Amen. We're delighted to have you back. Welcome, Sister Anita J. Green. Welcome, Sister Peggy Haley. Welcome, Sister Doreen Stokes Wil uh, Wilson. Amen. Amen and amen. We are delighted to have you on board. Amen. Welcome. Welcome, Sister Debbie Glover Scalford. Welcome, Sister Josephine Cutter Gordon. Welcome, Sister Laura Kennelly. Welcome, Sister Mary L. Smith. Welcome, Deacon Derek Green, all the way from Newcastle, Delaware. Welcome, Brother Charles Folly. Amen. Welcome, uh, Minister Tiffany D. Curtis. Welcome, Sister Deacon S. Couture. Tor C. Green, welcome, Sister Sheila Adams, welcome, Sister Doris Mickens, amen. We're delighted to have all of those persons who are sharing with us this afternoon, and we are blessed that you and uh, honored that you would tune in and share with us tonight. <clears throat> uh, we jump into the 18th chapter of the book of Acts as we continue our series uh, in, in the book of Acts, Acts, and tonight we are going to uh, be dealing with uh, Acts chapter 18. Uh, Paul, the first verse says, after these things, and after always, and, and whenever you read your Bible and you see those three words at the beginning, after these things, after means history, these means events and Things mean variety, and after a variety of events, Paul arrived at Athens. And let's see what led him up to Athens. He was, uh, uh, when we read uh, chapter 17, he was kicked out of uh, Thessalonica and left for dead. And then uh, he went to Berea. And uh, in Berea, the Judaizers dogged him like a hound dog, and they was on his track, and they came down to Berea and uh, kicked him out, and then he left, uh, he had to leave Berea. And that's what got him to uh, Athens, and when he got to Athens, 
Paul did something, he, he did something that you ought not ever do, a preacher ought not ever do, change up his style. Paul changed his style, uh, Deacon Simpson, and, uh, and, and, and he adopted the style of the philosophers, and he started philosophizing and competing uh, with uh, the likes of Aristotle and Socrates and, and Plato in, on Mars Hill, and he only got a few, uh, he only got a few converts a few converts and and he left Athens after he had after he had tarried there for a while he left Athens because he figured he had spent enough time in Athens and they did not want to really receive the word that was the intellectual uh, center of the world and it's hard for most intellectuals uh, to receive the gospel because they have closed their mind and they are and they are very proud of their accomplishments and uh, he had few converts. They would engage him in argument and dialogue, but uh, not many of them received the word of God, and he left Athens disappointed. Disappointed in the ministry. Mm. How do you, how do you encourage yourself when you are disappointed in ministry. First of all, first of all, you don't change up your style. And, and there, is, there, is a verse, there is a verse over in 1 Corinthians that I want to look at, 1 Corinthians chapter two, uh, Deacon Simpson, and uh, verses one through five. I wanna look at those verses. And uh, now that Paul has come to Corinth, he decided to go back to his style, go back to what made, makes him comfortable. And that's 1 Corinthians uh, chapter two, verse, starting at verse one. And read verses one through five and I'll say a word about that. 1 Corinthians chapter two, verses one, starting at verse one. And brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but the power of God. Now, uh, 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 Paul, he was capable of engaging in Aristotelian arguments and Socratic syllogisms and Shakespearean 14 line sonics written in iambic pentameters, but he have discovered that that does not work. And so when he, the verse one in chapter 18 said when he left Athens and came to Corinth, and this is the letter, the first letter that he, that he uh, sent to the Corinthians, and he says, brethren, when I came to you, I didn't try to compete with the philosophers. Uh, I, didn't have, I didn't try to show how intellectual I was. Look at verse one uh, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter two, verse one. He says, and I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellency of speech and wisdom uh, uh, of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God, but I made up in my mind, I determined, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul goes back to his original style and he goes back to preaching Jesus. 
There was a story, there was a story, there was a story of the little boy, of the little boy who was in Sunday school class and uh, the teacher was teaching uh, the class and, 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 and the class says, he was trying to get the class involved and he said, what's hairy and what's got a long fuzzy tail and he climbs a tree and he eat nuts. And uh, the little boy raised his hand and he said, Jesus. And the teacher got upset and says, I'm going to get your daddy who's a deacon. You ought know better than that. Uh, you, know, you, 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 you know it, that's not the answer. And he went and got his daddy and his daddy came in the room and, and his daddy said, son, well, what's going on? He said, daddy, I know he was talking about a squirrel, but I thought maybe he was going to talk about Jesus. And, and, and so Paul, now when he gets to Corinth, he gets to Corinth, he says, I determined, I made up in my mind that I'm not going to, to try and compete with the philosophers like I did in Athens because I was discouraged. I was discouraged and I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. And how often it is we look for a certain style rather than the word, and, and uh, rather than the word. You see, you, you, you see, uh, 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 we, we like charismatic stuff. We like for him, the preacher, to say it pretty. And, uh, and I got another story for you. There was there was there was the preacher. The preacher came to his congregation one evening, one one Sunday morning, and he and he started his sermon. And then all of a sudden, he said, "A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, L, S, T, U, V, X, Y, Z. And folk were shouting all over the church. And, and all of a sudden, he just stopped. And he said, all I said was my ABCs. And y'all just shouting all over the church. <laughs> I thought y'all would like that. I didn't, I didn't see no hands in the chat. But, 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 but at any rate. The little boy said, I thought he, since we were in Sunday school and since we were in church, I thought maybe he would be talking about Jesus. I know he was talking about a squirrel. And sometimes we, are, we get all wrapped up in a sound rather than what is said. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen for giving me a shout out. Amen, amen. And, and sometimes we get all wrapped up in a style rather than substance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so after these things, Paul, Paul departed Athens and came to Corinth and came to Corinth and he was discouraged. His head was hanging down, but he was still determined to go on in ministry. And I got a real word there for somebody. Sometimes when you, when you are discouraged, you just got to keep on going. See, God does not, God does not always deal with us in the spectacular. Sometimes he deals with us on a low ebb. And, 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 and you know, sometimes how we, we want a real high service and a real mountaintop experience, God does not always deal with us with the mountaintop experiences. And so Paul there, 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 are, there are four things that governed or four principles that guides his ministry. And, uh, and y'all already know it. We, we, we just didn't call it by that. But, but you're going to see all four of them right here in these 11 verses. You're going to see all four principles that guided uh, 
calls ministry. And there ought to always, there ought to always, uh, let me see if I can say it again, there ought to always be some principles that guide your organization and not only your organization and not only the church, but there ought to be some principles that guide your life. And anybody doubt that, you just read the church covenant. It says as, 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 as we are to walk circumspectively in the world. What does that mean to walk circumspectively in the world? That means that I live by some principles and there's a line that I'm not going to cross. You can push my button all you want to. There's a line that I'm not going to cross because I walk circumspectively and, and circum, it means a circle. In other words, I'm not going out of the circle. I'm not going to let folk push me to the point where I lose it and go outside of the circle because I live by principles, by principles that's found in the word of the Lord. And Paul, and I'm going to give you these, these four principles that, that guided Paul's ministry, uh, they are evangelism. And uh, not only are they evangelism, but it's discipleship. Wherever he went, he evangelized, he made disciples, he worshiped, and he fellowshiped. Those, 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 Deacon Simpson, those are, those are the principles that governed his ministry, and they are good principles for any church. Paul used those principles wherever he went. He used those same principles to guide his ministry. And uh, we say it another way at Second Mount Zion, but it's the same thing. There are four major principles that guides every ministry in the church. And so when you get ready to do something uh, so that we walk circumspectively, you ask yourself the question. And the question is, what does it have to do with evangelism? And if it has nothing to do with evangelism, you say, what does it have to do with discipleship? And if it has nothing to do with discipleship, you say, what does it have to do with worship? And then finally, you ask yourself the question, what does it have to do with fellowship, meaningful fellowship? Not, not you know, uh, 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 not that's just, uh, uh, just getting together just for the sake of getting together. Fellowship where we glean from each other. Fellowship where we grow together. And so those ought to be, those are good principles uh, that, that's good to govern every church. You know why I say that? Because, uh, because of uh, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, go ye therefore into all the world and make disciples of all men. And lo, I am with you all ways. We are, we are tied in to the mandate that Jesus left on record. And we, and we, derive, we, de we derive some principles from, uh, from those, from that command. Yeah. And so after these things, Paul was, Paul was discouraged because he only had a few converts in, in Athens and Corinth was ripe. It was ripe for evangelism. And Corinth, Corinth, let me, let, let, let me just say, it was not a good thing to be called a Corinth because to be called a Corinth mean that you were a lewd person. You was, a, you was a person without morals or principles because uh, 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 Corinth was a seaport town 
And uh, that's where all of the cargo came in to Corinth and then was dispersed through the rest of the world and particularly the Roman Empire. And so you had all kinds of people from everywhere and, uh, and, 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 and you had all kinds of lewd people. It, it, it would be an insult for his morals and his outlook on life if you were called a correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, was, it, it was said by some, uh, someone was going out to Corinthize, which meant that the person was intended to commit some immoral act. It meant that they were going to commit some immoral act because that was, that was, that was Corinth. Corinth, was, Corinth believed to have had at least 10,000 prostitutes and sodomites that were rented out day by day. Corinth, Corinth, <clears throat> Corinth was a rough place. The culture was lewd and, and uh, all kinds of things. And Paul felt that it was right from, for some sensitive evangelism. Because evangelism is what guided his, uh, was one of the principles, Deacon Charles, that guided his ministry. Hmm. Because cause sometimes, sometimes, watch this now, watch this. Sometimes we, we bring, how can I put it? Sometimes we bring trouble to ourselves. Let, uh, Dick Simpson, can you get me, uh, can you get me uh, Acts chapter 9 and, and verse 15? Acts chapter 9, verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Now, Paul pursued his passion over his purpose. And how often it is, my brothers and my sisters, we pursue our passion and, and, we, and we blame it on the Lord. The Lord told me to do this. And I feel like the Lord is leading me. No, no, no. You're leading yourself. That is your passion and not your purpose. Because Paul was passionate because he was a Jew. He wanted to see his brother say, but that was not his priority. And we're going to see in chapter 18. We're going to see in chapter 18 when he really gets it. God had to let him go through some stuff and allow him to be beat up and beat down and discouraged. And you will discover in this chapter 18, he says, from now on, I'm going to shake the dust off my feet and I'm going to the Gentile. That's, brother, that's where you should have been in the first place. Every time he would, every time, every time he would hit time, he would go straight to the synagogue. That was his desire. That was his passion, not God's purpose for his life. Let's, 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 let's go on, let's go on, let's go on here, let's go on here. Uh, and so we already see that one of the guiding principles for his ministry is evangelism. And he found certain, oh, oh let me just finish chapter, verse one. Uh, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And so we said a word about Corinth, uh, uh, the Corinthians and uh, and, and uh, let, let, me say, let me say another word about the Corinthians. I'm going to give you another scripture. I'm going to give you all the scriptures up front. First uh, uh, Corinthians, and, 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 and you, you know, if you've been around Second Mount Zion for a little bit, you probably know it by heart. First Corinthians chapter uh, 1, verse 12. This, uh, Corinth was messed up. 
1 Corinthians 1, verse 12. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I of Christ. Now, now uh, the Corinthians were so divided. The church, and, 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 and I, y'all know how I like to put it, Corinth is a, a, a microcosm of every church, including your church including the church that you are a member of because they were so divided and they were so messed up because they had all of those union, that was a union town because it was a seaport town and uh, most of the church, most of the folk from church, they came from, from uh, Corinth, they came into the church and they worked on those union jobs where they had seniority and they brought that mess into the church. And the reason I know that, because uh, Deacon Simpson just read it, verse 1, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 12, it says, I of Paul, and you got to know what, what it meant when Paul says, y'all running around here talking about, I am of Paul. In other words, Paul was the organizer of the church at Corinth, and those who was with Paul in the beginning claimed seniority on all the rest of the folk. And don't you tell me that you don't have seniority in your church. You might say that everybody is equal and everybody is on equal footing and we are all the same, but you don't mean that in your action because I've heard you say that she just got here, he just got here, How? and I've been here all these years. They claim the Paul, the Paul party folk in Corinth, they claim seniority on other folk. He says, I of Paul and I of Apollos. There was another group saying that I am of Apollos and Apollos folk were, they were the the more educated folk. They were the one uh, who could persuade you with eloquent speech and wisdom. And Paul said, I tried that one time and it didn't work. And so there was a group in your church, a group in your church. And, uh, and, 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 uh, and if you invite, invite me there, and if I'm there more than 30 minutes, I can tell you who they are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He said, I am of Apollos. And, and, and there's a group in your church says that I am of Cephas, and that's another name for Peter. And Peter was a Jew, and he believed more so by the law than he, than he believed by the Lord. He put more emphasis on the law than he did. And there are, mo- there are folk in your church and my church and every church, they put a lot of emphasis on the law and bylaws rather than the word of the Lord. church at Corinth, they were, they were messed up. But if you look at the text, if you look at the text that he just read, it says, I of, I of Paul, I of Apollos, I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Now, the first time in the whole chapter, Paul uses Christ by himself meaning that he is the anointed one he is the messiah in other words in other words there are folk who are in your church and my church who identify with Christ but he's not lord in their life these are the folk who they, 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 are, they are members of the church, but they still do everything that they used to do and you don't see no growth in them because they identify with Christ, but Jesus is not Lord in their life. Everywhere else in chapter, uh, uh, in chapter 1 uh, of 1 Corinthians, you, you will see Paul say, Jesus Christ, our Lord, or our Lord, Jesus Christ. But this particular time in verse 12, he says Christ by itself, because there is a group who identify with Christ and but not his lordship. They, they identify with him, but not his lordship. And you know how I like to put it. They use him as a spare tie. They only call him Lord when they're in trouble. 
Oh, Lord, if you get me out of this one, I clear I won't do it no more. But, but the brother, but, but the, 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 the brother was discouraged. And look how the Lord, look how the Lord, the Lord knows how to encourage us. Look at the text, look at the next, look at the next verse. And he found certain Jews named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius, the Roman emperor, had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. Paul found them. He found some like-minded people, some Jews who were interested in the word of the Lord. And here is another principle that, that guided his, his ministry. He discipled Aquila and Priscilla. He discipled them. These are the principles that guide his ministry. And he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, oh, the Lord, look how the Lord Lord is lifting up his head. He's not only put him with some other Jews, but some of them who has the same trade, and now they got more than, they got a whole lot of other stuff in common, plus the Lord Jesus Christ. The primary thing that they have in common is the Lord Jesus Christ, but they got, uh, uh, they got ethnicity in common and they got uh, occupations in common. Paul was also a tent maker and he stayed with them and worked for, by occupation, they were tent makers and here is the next one. Here is the next principle that guided, here is the next principle that guided his ministry. What is that principle? Worship. It's right here in the text. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks, both Jews and Greeks. Yeah, and, and God, you know, he left, he left, he left Athens. He was so disappointed because he only had a few converts. He tried to match worldly wisdom. He tried to match worldly wisdom, uh, you know, out on Mars Hills. And he had, and they said, oh, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, we'll, we'll hear you again on this. But all they wanted to do was just dialogue and, and, uh, and Paul was disappointed. But look at verse 5. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled in the spirit. God, God has lifted his spirit so he was compelled in the spirit to testify uh, and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. He kept silent. He was silent until he got his help, until he got his partners. And, and we, all, we, also, we also need some partners in ministry. We need partners in ministry, not enemies. We got enough natural enemies and see, everybody, everybody who's a member of the church ought to be a partner, ought to be a partner so we can do ministry. You don't see, you don't see partners fight against each other. You don't see partners trying to undermine each other. You don't see partners saying that, well, you know, I'm doing this over here and, uh, and, uh, and that's all I'm worrying about is I'm worrying about my little thing succeeding and I don't care about yours and then you look down but yet you are of the same body of Christ we are partners just the sight Brother Vaughn, just the sight of Silas and Timothy encouraged Paul's soul until he was compelled to say something and he spoke boldly to both the Jews and the Greeks Hmm. 
But when they opposed him and blasphemed, watch this, and blasphemed, he shook his garment and said to them, these are the Jews now, your blood be upon your own heads. I'm clean. From now on, verse 6 says, I will go to the Gentiles. That's where he should have been in the first place. That should have been his priority. God chose him first to be a priority to the gent. That's why God chose him. But he followed his passion rather than his purpose. And how often it is, my brothers and my sisters, that we follow our passion rather than our purpose and we cover it up in religious garb and we make it look like I'm doing it for the Lord. No, no, no. But you're following your passion, not your purpose. In other words, you're doing it for yourself. Paul wanted all of his kinsmen and his kinfolk saved. And that's how he had a love for the Jews, but they weren't ready for the gospel. And, and sometimes we try to shove the gospel down folk and when they are not ready for the gospel, ah, uh, when they are not ready for the gospel, when they are not ready for the gospel, you can't force folk to eat when they don't want to eat. Brother Vaughn down there where he came from, they had a phrase that said, you can lead a horse to the trough, but you can't make him drink. You can give out the gospel, but you can't make folk receive it. And they weren't ready. And Paul says in verse 6, he shook his garments, which is symbolic of shaking the dust off his feet. He said, your blood be on your own head, for I'm clean. I have done my responsibility, and you have rejected. From now on, I'll go to the Gentiles. And I read that scripture over there in chapter 9 and verse 15 where it's, it, God called him uh, to be an apostle for the Gentiles and then the Jews. And Paul reversed God's order. And how often it is, my brothers and my sisters, when God tells us something, we reverse the order. He says... You ought to give as God has prospered you, and we give what is left. We reverse the order. Let me move on, because, uh, you know, y'all getting, getting quiet on me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, verse 7, and he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justus, one who worship God whose house was next door to the synagogue. Good God Almighty. Look how God blessed Paul. He, he moved out of the synagogue. The Jews didn't want him there no more. He shook the dust off his feet and moved right next door to the synagogue. And so folk were used to coming and they came to Justice House. Amen. Right next door. But at least one seed was planted. Verse 8 says, And Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all of his households. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believing, and were baptized. 1 Corinthians 126. Because Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, he had heard Paul preach the gospel. He believed and his whole, he, hear, he heard something first. He heard 
Uh, <clears throat> let me see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and many of the Corinthians <clears throat> hearing believed and were baptized. You got to hear something before you can receive something. See, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. But the ruler of the synagogue and justice who owned the house next door, these were folk of means. Now, watch this 126. First Corinthians 126. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Not many noble are called, but God always leave room for a few. The ruler of the synagogue has been listening to Paul and he heard the gospel and he left the synagogue and went with Paul because he heard about the true and the living God. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord, him and his whole household, and, and see, when, when he got the noble, he got a whole lot of other folk because he was in a position of influence. How do you use your influence? Do you use your influence to influence folk for Jesus Christ? Or are you trying to build your own little kingdom? Or are you trying to prove that you've got some power? This ruler of the synagogue, influenced his whole household for Jesus Christ. Paul, look how God, look how God lifts up his head. First of all, he allows him to run into Aquila and Priscilla. And then he sends Silas and Timothy, his partners, and now he's getting converts. And watch this, verse 9. Now, the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. He says, do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. Do not be afraid. Speak and do not be silent. And, and, and here it is. And here it is, and uh, this ought to encourage all of us. For I am with you. I am with you. Isn't that in the Great Commission? He said, when you do, when you do what I've commanded you to do, lo, I am with you. Always, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have, watch this, many people in this city. You might have got a few in Athens. And, and was discouraged. But what does the Lord say? The Lord says, I have many people in this city. There's a real word there for us. There's a real word there for us that if our ministry is governed by those four principles that we see in Paul's ministry, uh, and in our ministry, if we are about evangelism, discipleship, worship, and fellowship, God is saying to us that I have much people in this city. And I think I said, you know, we need to develop relationship with the folk who are being destructive. And I don't mean up in their face and in their house, but we need to be out there so that they, they can see us.
for I have much people in this city. And he, he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. This is one of the longest stays. This is the second longest stay in Paul's ministry. He stayed in Ephesus, I think Ephesus for three years, but he stayed, stays here for a year and six months preaching the word of God and discipling people and strengthening them in the faith. A year and six months. And folk, both Gentiles and Greeks, are receiving the Lord. Paul's ministry is being blessed, and God has lifted up his head once again, and God has encouraged him. I said, God has encouraged him. And sometimes when we are discouraged in ministry, we got to keep on going. Paul was discouraged, but he was still determined. And he was determined to go to a ripe field. In other words, Athens, you've heard enough of the gospel and you have rejected it. Now I'm going to the Gentiles and now he's in the place and, and with the people that he's been called for. And whenever, watch this, you are in the place where God has called you, I don't care how much opposition come against you, you're going to be successful. Y'all didn't hear me, did you? Because he says, for I am with you because I have much people in this city. And I'm talking to somebody tonight that you've been discouraged in the ministry. When I look at this seasoned preacher, he was discouraged, but also determined. And sometimes we are right at the point where God is just about to bless us and just about to make us successful. We are just at the crack of dawn and we give up. The gray lines of the morning is just about to disturb the foliage of the darkness and you give up. Paul was discouraged, chased out of Thessalonica, chased out of Berea, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah. no converts hardly in Athens, but look at him now. God had to, God had to deal with the apostle Paul for nine chapters to get him to see that this is your purpose. I want you to follow your purpose and not your passion. I know your passion is with your people. Y'all not listening to me. His passion was with the Jews because that was his philosophy for life. The Jew first and then the Gentile. And uh, and he stuck with that a little bit too long. God had already said, came through the, to the Jewish nation first and then to the Gentiles. Even when he came to the Gentiles, the, the Jews in Abraham's day, he said, Abraham, your purpose is to be a blessing for the rest, for the whole world. But the Jews focused everything in on them. But now that Paul is in the right place and with the right people, now he's being successful. God bless you. And uh, be encouraged tonight. Follow your purpose and not necessarily your passion. Because if you follow your purpose, the passion will come. 
Gracious God, our fathers, we come now to say, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this time that you have allowed us to share with, the, with one another. We pray now that the seed of the gospel will fall upon good soil and that the harvest will truly be great in the masterful and in the marvelous name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord.